Today we start talking about uh, the prevention of uh, radicalization. That has become the key word uh, for much of the research. Uh, some people talk about prevention of radicalization, others talk about prevention of extremism, yet others talk about prevention of terrorism. These are overlapping areas uh, and we will go and look at them at vari from various locations since prevention can happen online as uh, Sarah Zeiger and Joseph Geitli uh, have shown in their chapter. It can happen in the prison camps as Barbara Sude will uh, explain. It can happen in uh, educational institutions as Thomas Samuel will say for the secular institutions and uh, for the <coughs> religious seminaries, we will hear what Asad Ula Khan and Ifra Vaka have said. And uh, so for each of these areas of human uh, about uh, whether it's prisons or schools, there are different ways people get radicalized. It seems to be that there's almost no area where you are safe from radicalization. But the word itself is ambiguous and people use it in different ways. Many link it with radicalism, but uh, actually historically, radical political parties were not necessarily violent. They were like situated somewhere between uh, liberalism and socialism. And when I started to do research on uh, terrorism, it was the Dutch uh, radical party who uh, created or instigated the creation of a commission for nonviolent conflict resolution, of which I was for a while uh, the deputy secretary. So uh, radicalism is not the same as extremism, uh, but these are linked in uh, ways yet to be explored. I have done some of that exploration in the opening uh, chapters of uh, the handbook, where I have also offered key definitions of terrorism, of radicalization, of extremism. These are all contested uh, concepts. And especially when it comes to uh, terrorism, there has been uh, no international agreement, though there have been regional conventions that have been signed. The UN General Assembly has uh, no uh, agreed definition, though uh, various other sectors of the UN, especially the Security Council, have come up with suggestions, but they lack the legitimacy of a broad uh, consensus. The change of terminology to extremism is partly due, be, due to the inability to uh, find a solution for the definition of terrorism. And uh, when I started to doing uh, research in the era of radicalization, it was the Dutch intelligence service that inspired the use of uh, the word radicalization, it was then taken over by the European Commission and for a while I was part of a commission that was to look into a violent radicalization, which is also a bit of a misnomer because the radicalization was towards one particular type of violence, while the radicalization itself was not uh, violent. So there are problems and uh, challenges with uh, these uh, terms. I tried to reconceptualize radicalization after I found a number of inconsistencies in the existing government uh, uh, efforts to radicalization. And perhaps Antoinette uh, can uh, bring uh, on the screen, yeah, it's on the screen now, uh, how I tried to find a solution. And this solution, together with some other definitions, I have presented to the co-authors in this volume, and to a various extent, they found uh, this uh, definition useful in their particular context. But uh, it's very difficult to find a consensus 
in uh, this area. But many agree that uh, radicalization consists on the one hand to a socialization to a particular ideological and intellectual position. And that is then followed by a mobilization into social movements or asocial movements that uh, embrace this uh, particular world orientation. But in reality, mobilization sometimes precedes the socialization. We've seen it in the case of the so-called Islamic State that the first thing they did to uh, the newcomers, the more than 40,000 foreign fighters and their families that joined uh, the Islamic State in 1914, they gave them a two weeks crash course in what they considered to be the authentic interpretation of Islam, one that served their violent purposes. So socialization and mobilizations are key factors. And uh, these can uh, take place in various contexts. I see that Alexander von Rosenbach has joined us here. So he might want to say some words how ICCT looks at radicalization and radicalization research as well. The word, uh, I give the word to you, Alexander. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Schmidt, and apologies, everyone, for the uh, the slight technical delay that kept me uh, out and kept us a little bit behind schedule. With that note, I will uh, be especially brief today. I just firstly wanted to welcome you all to what is the second in a series of ongoing webinars where we are focusing our attention on the amazing contributions of Professor Schmidt and his uh, and his colleagues through the the handbook. Uh, we did our first session in uh, late 2020 and. Uh, we're very excited about the both level of engagement and the feedback that we got from that and have followed that through here to part two, which is, as you just heard, uh, focused on the issue of prevention of radicalization in particular. Um, ICCT, uh, to, to Professor Schmidt's point, is actually quite... Um, uh, the issue of radicalization is quite critical and, and top of mind to us right now, no uh, small part, because we have just stepped into a large... Uh, multi-year uh, partnership with the European Commission as part of its radicalization awareness network. And ICCT has a leading role in there along with a number of other think tanks, research organizations and uh, other similar organizations who uh, are really tasked with trying to understand the phenomena across the European context and to work with policymakers, practitioners and, and uh, researchers to help move uh, to a more safe and secure society. And what I think we see there as we start to understand that, uh, that challenge, which is um, both very ambitious, but also very critical that we, that we do this correctly is, um, yeah, that it really cuts across all uh, swaths of society. So what we see is indeed the need to understand it in the home, particularly now in the period of COVID, where we have a lot more closed communities, closed individual societies, um, but also individual families, where uh, the exposure to radicalization is it's harder to detect in the sort of normal day-to-day uh, -day life where you might have a number of different uh, overlapping social environments. Um, the, we certainly see it in the prison context, both in terms of the understanding of violent extremist offenders in prison now, uh, within the domestic sphere and also those that are slowly moving back from uh, the Middle East, Iraq and Syria, particularly women and children and the effects of uh, that radicalization process on them. And then also what that tells us, and we come to this perhaps later, the uh, what we need to do as societies to uh, help move people through the pathway of de-radicalization. And I think we cannot do that effectively unless we understand more uh, in much more depth, the, the social, political uh, security uh, impulses that drive someone into, uh, into a radicalized environment. And I think uh, the conversation we'll hear today is really going to help uh, shed some light on that. Indeed, it is in, in a very different process for different people, different communities, in different settings, in prison, in school, uh, in social uh, settings, uh, in religious communities, and we get the chance today to hear from uh, quite a range of, of authors who have thought about this very hard and, and we, um, 
yeah, really get, I think, to move that uh, conversation forward in an important way. I will, um, I think, stop there. Uh, I just wanted to make a short note on logistics today because we do have quite a, a range of panelists. We have six uh, presentations. We decided to uh, chop it up a little bit. So we'll have three presentations from speakers. Then we'll do a short Q&A that uh, Professor Schmidt and I will moderate. And then we'll open up for the sort of the back half of the session and we'll do another three presentations and, and another session of Q&A just so that we don't have to wait to hear from the, uh, the audience today. So I would encourage you, if you are listening and you have questions for the panelists, please use the Q&A function uh, to launch those. We will keep an eye on them as we go through today's events and we will pick the, up those questions uh, as we go along. Um, the last point, I guess, is that we uh, do think that these sessions are um, impactful, but we don't want that to just be our thought. So we have a small post-event survey that we launch at the end of this webinar. It usually pops up on your screen when you exit. Please give us two minutes of your time to tell us how this was for you. If we can make this more uh, effective for you in different formats, uh, you know, we are looking to improve this uh, as we go along. So it'd be great to get your feedback uh, on that. I will uh, give the floor back to you, Professor Smith, if you want to uh, introduce our first panelist. Thanks. Thank you, Alexander. We have uh, chapters 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 to discuss. The first three uh, deal with uh, rethinking the role of education and then radicalization in prisons and then uh, in refugee camps and asylum centers. Uh, Thomas Samuel worked for the Malay government before he joined uh, UN Office on Drugs and Crime, where he is engaged in uh, regional efforts. He has been publishing a number of uh, monographs and uh, articles on what is going on in uh, schools and universities in uh, Southeast Asia. It has always been amazing for me that something that uh, started in the Arab world uh, can switch so easily to other parts of the world where they share the same religion to some extent, but are culturally quite different. So, Thomas, can you tell us something about the challenges that you have uh, in uh, countering radicalization at educational institutions, summarizing some findings from uh, your chapter for the Handbook of Terrorism Prevention? The word is to you, Thomas. Have you made some PowerPoints? Uh, yes, I have. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Alex. Thank you, ICCT, for this opportunity uh, to share a little bit uh, from my chapter. Um, you all know um, Professor Alex is a very good academic. He's that, and he has been like a mentor. Take this opportunity to just thank him for this. Um, basically, when we think of uh, PCVE, when we think of counterterrorism, we look at the police, we look at military, we look at intelligence agencies. Uh, we think of hard approach, the kinetic approach. But here, I'd just like you all to consider the possibility of looking at education at the forefront of PCVE. Uh, next slide, please. So when, when we look at education, uh, we know that it's oftentimes a target for violent extremists, but it also cuts both ways. Um, um, while we know that uh, terrorists oftentimes target young people, they target education, it's seen as, uh, it's perceived as an alien imposition. For example, uh, what Boko Haram uh, looks at education. Um, they target girls. Uh, it's, uh, education is oftentimes seen as a symbol of government power, of authority. So it's oftentimes under attack. But the question that I was trying to look at was this, can education be seen as a tool against violent extremism? Um, next slide, please. Um, not only looking at education as a tool, but looking at it as the primary tool. Uh, Peter Neumann's definition of radicalization, what goes on before the bomb goes off? And, it, in, and indeed, what, what actually happens before the bomb goes off? Um, we find terrorists identifying the potential target, terrorists pushing their narrative, uh, uh, inspiring, persuading potential recruits, grooming potential recruits. In all of these instances, 
Um, I would like to suggest that education, if at all it's tailor-made, can play a pivotal role uh, when it comes to countering these issues. Um, education reaches almost every corner of a nation. The time frame that a, an individual has with education is at least 11 to 13 years, and you have a dedicated avenue to reach the youth of a nation. So meaning to say that infrastructure is already there. Uh, next slide, please. So I would like to suggest, and what I've been trying to do in this chapter is to say that we can, to a certain extent, tailor make educational institutions, that they can actually meet, uh, uh, first we need to identify cognitive and emotional spheres, uh, particularly among young people who are vulnerable. To teach, uh, and to target and teach specific qualities, uh, to seek out as outside assistance uh, in reinforcing PCV, for example, looking for help and backup, and, uh, and I'll come to this in a second to develop a specific syllabus on PCVE, to train specialized teachers, build up net networks of specialist expertise. For example, among uh, psychologists, counselors, religious leaders, life coaches. And lastly, to develop a monitoring and evaluation mechanism. What are we doing right when it comes to education? What are we doing wrong and how can we improve? Next slide, please. So the goal of education, uh, firstly, everybody knows this, is to protect the student from violent extremism while the student is in an institution of learning. But if we could go one step further, what happens if we could impart and equip students with all that is necessary to prevent them from ever considering violent extremism in the future? Now, we have that goal when it comes to them becoming law-abiding citizens. Why not this? Next slide, please. So one of the vehicles that we talk about is by integrating PC, integrating PCVE components within subjects already taught in schools and universities. So for example, when I, when I teach students, when I talk to them about history, I talk to them about the Communist Party of Malaya in Malaysia. Uh, and we look at it as a case study. So while I'm teaching history, uh, we are inculcating in them um, a critical thinking, the ability to see history, to analyze history. What happens if we could do that with ethics, with moral education, with philosophy, with religious studies? The second aspect is to teach young people biographies. I cannot stress how important this is. Inspirational stories of Velupalai Prabhakaran are what, or what led many young people to join the LTTE. Why not if we could have Nadia Morad, Malala Yousafzai, Ishmael Bear, if we could tell young people about stories like this, indeed, we would make a difference. Young people are not so much interested with models and concepts, but whenever we talk about people, um, it really resonates with them. Uh, next, next slide, please. There is the idea of contact hypothesis. Um, basically, contact hypothesis states that if you bring people from various cultures, uh, from various religions, races, if you increase, if you bring them into greater contact with each other, there's a possibility that that would increase understanding. That could reduce prejudice. And that is a fantastic hedge of protection against terrorism. So activities like sports, extracurricular activities like uniform bodies, clubs, societies, volunteerism, student exchange programs, all these are vehicles that we could use to actually prove the contact hypothesis. Next slide, please. The role of teachers again and again, it's, I, I can't stress that. So in the earlier model, we had the banking model of education in which the role of a teacher is just to go and give knowledge. But if we could make it into a student-centric approach, that means it's no longer just the transfer of knowledge, but rather transmission of values. And where the teacher no longer plays the role of just instructing, but plays the role of mentoring and guiding a student. And here, we could make great inroads when it comes to PCVE. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so we need help. Teachers alone might not be able to do this. To get rehabilitated extremists, Nasir Abbas, uh, an Indonesian former JI senior leader, does fantastic work uh, with regards to students in Indonesia. Uh, Arno Michaelis, whom I met in a Hidayah function organized by Sarah's uh, team back in Hidayah, um, he, he was a white supremacist, and yet his story has resonated literally with thousands of young people in Southeast Asia. I've used his video, I've used the uh, uh, his story to be able to, to create a, a, a awareness on, on what we can do with regards to PCE. Uh, next slide, please. Um, using uh, victims of terrorism, in this particular case, Christiane Boudreau, uh, we have used her video extensively to reach out to young people. Uh, in this sense, if I could quote uh, Professor Alex Smith, who said, victims and survivors' voices need not only be heard, but ought to be amplified. And here I'd like to state that education is a powerful tool to actually amplify the voices of victims of terrorism. Uh, next slide, please. 
um, we can also count on influencers, celebrities, and youth heroes. Uh, these are people that young people look up to, to tell the story for us and inculcate that in the education system. So this young boy that you see, uh, he is a rapper. He has nothing to do with PCVE. But I told him the story of Nadia Murad. And what he did was he basically made a rap uh, with the regard on, based on the life uh, of Nadia Murad. And he reached millions in Southeast Asia. And what we did was whenever we go to schools, we use his videos to reach out to young people. So the idea here is this, we need to get people whom the youth will listen to. So in this sense, we can count on people like this. Uh, next slide, please. So we need to arm the young people, arm them with what? Critical thinking, uh, both online and offline. They need to evaluate ideas well. Digital literacy is very important here. Secondly, with regards to empathy, we need to teach them how to empathize. And, and this, we need to be careful here. If we just teach them empathy and they learn how to empathize with people only like themselves, we would have a bigger problem. So it's just, it's not only to teach them empathy, but to teach them that empathy must go beyond their group to teach them diversity, uh, the appreciation of those, not just of different color, culture, and religion, but also those with different thinking, with different values. How do we approach them? And not only to appreciate that, but how do we resolve differences when it comes to, when we have differences of opinion, of thinking? And resilience. Uh, basically, terrorists again and again have targeted young people when they are down, when, when, they, are, when, they, are, uh, when they have problems, when they're at that moment, they're susceptible and vulnerable. So we need to teach young people how to bounce back. We need to teach them how to remain vigilant when they are actually down. Lastly, and we have found this quantitatively and qualitatively. If we can show young people the failure of violence, we can actually teach them case studies on how groups that have used extremism have oftentimes failed. And at the same time, it could show them the power of nonviolence. We could talk to them about the works of Malala Yousafzai, of Mahatma Gandhi, of Martin Luther King. These things make a difference in the lives of young people. When they hear these stories, and oftentimes what we take for granted they should know, unfortunately they might not know. And it's good that we can arm these students. And of course, this is done comprehensively, creatively, way when you start school, from when you're in elementary one, primary one, right up to when you finish school. Next slide, please. One of the significant things that we find, not just in this region, is the phenomenon of non-violent yet radical groups. These are groups that, they, while they do not um, openly advocate violence, um, Ed Hussein has, has said this, certain worldviews, even when held without advocating violence, provides the mood music that encourages terrorist acts. We now have these kind of groups in this part of the world. What can you do against these kind of groups? They have not done any crime at that, at that, at that moment of time. You can't put them in jail. So these people have a open access to our young people. Unless you educate our young people, we are in for a lot of trouble. Um, next slide, please. Um, Abu Bakr Bashir is a very well-known terrorist leader in my part of the world. He said this, I am only a craftsman selling knives. I am not responsible for how those knives are used. Basically, he said, look, I am just talking. I am an old man. How can you say that I am a terrorist? And unfortunately, he's talking in the form of being a teacher in one of us in one of the so-called religious school has influenced thousands of young people in my part of the world. And the only way that we can counter his idea is by putting forth another idea. Um, next slide, please. But there are challenges. Uh, there are real challenges when it comes to trying to introduce PCV interventions in education. Number one, there's a lack of studies on the effectiveness of educational interventions in PCVE. So we need quantitative and qualitative studies. We need to see what works and what does not work. We need to have an intervention with a control group where it doesn't have the intervention and with the intervention and see whether there's any difference in the perception, thinking, and perhaps even behavior of young people. Number two, there are inherent limitations of such PCV interventions when addressing certain drivers of radicalization. When a youth or young person is radicalized because of the blatant corruption or injustice he sees in the authorities, at that moment, if we improve his ability to think critically, we are not going to reduce his chances of joining violent extremism. So there are some, some drivers and triggers in which uh, even while we have uh, interventions in PCV interventions in education, it might not necessarily work. There is the possibility of interventions alienating parts of the student population. If it is not done properly, 
if educators, educators and PCB interventions could stigmatize and alienate the very young people that they are trying to reach. So we need to be careful of this. Lastly, there's a possibility of teachers and teaching institutes not willing or sufficiently equipped or trained to handle such a role. Oftentimes there's the idea of securitizing education and there are some teachers, some teaching institutions which are not comfortable with this. Many, many teachers, you just can't give them PCV to do if they, they are not trained. And also there's a possibility that there could be inherent prejudices among the educators themselves. And if that is not dealt with, we might actually uh, exacerbate the problem. My last slide, please. It's basically just to quote uh, Nelson Mandela, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than uh, its opposite. And here, I'd just like to stress the power of education. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Thomas, for summarizing 40 pages of your chapters in eight to 10 minutes. That was quite a feat. Thank you. We now turn to uh, Gary Hill, who has to uh, summarize 40 years of experience in uh, dealing with prisons and prison education. So Gary, the word is uh, to you. Thank you. Uh, when we talk about prisons, the uh, general general perception of, of just about everybody, including some professionals, is that radicalization of potential terrorists is rampant in prisons. The reality is that's not true. There are a uh, relatively small number of people in prison for terrorist acts. And what studies have shown, and, and we mentioned it in the chapter, Many people do become radicalized in prison because it's an atmosphere that uh, is ripe for people to dislike the system. And the longer they uh, serve their time, no matter what their, their crime, the easier it is for them to convince themselves that it's not them, it's society, it, it's others. So they, they would be ripe for radicalization. But what some very good studies show is people, many of those who become radicalized in prison, the minute they walk out the door are no longer radicalized and they're not joining some of the groups that work. Having said that, it's only to say that prisons matter. They, they matter from two places. One, they matter because we need to, to work hard to prevent people from becoming radicalized. And that's a combination of security and communication, but prisons matter also because they give us an excellent laboratory, if you will, or venue, much as Thomas mentioned with schools, where we can educate people and uh, lower the temperature of potential radicalization. So, so the security only approach in prisons, and we, we go into this fairly heavily in the chapter, we talk about some of the methods because the chapter is, is much more practical than philosophical. It's more from a prison operator's standpoint or a prison uh, security officer's standpoint than it is from a, a philosophical standpoint. So number one, uh, prisons do matter. They matter a great deal. The current major discourse that a lot of prisons have centers around how people who are, who are radical or convicted of terrorist activities, how they should be housed. Should they be kept all together in one place so they can be watched and have special programming? Should they be dispersed throughout the general population? When you talk with, with prison professionals, that's mainly the discussion you hear. And we go through in the chapter the pros and cons of the different approaches of mixing or keeping the uh, potential radicals separate. The reality is it depends on each individual institution and the population they have, especially if they're in an area where they have a large number of radicals because of, of current situations. Uh, something that the uh, news has shown most of us in uh, the last couple of weeks comes from my country of the United States where we had, as I think most of you know, a major attack on our nation's capital. 
There are currently close to a thousand people who will be charged with crimes as a result of that. Most of the crimes will um, uh, be illegal entry, vandalism. There, there will be very few probably that will be charged with terrorism itself. However, all of those who are sentenced into a prison, whether it's for vandalism or uh, violence against a staff member, their crime will not say radicalization, but they will be in prison or in jail, remand, uh, pretrial, because of political, because of, of terrorist act, uh, thoughts. That's what caused them to commit the crime. So the prison staff, even though we handle the same types of security measures we would for anybody who uh, commits violence or, or damage, uh, Mentally, we, we've got to be a little bit more aware of how we work with them so we don't, as the doctors like to say, make the situation worse. And we go into, into some of these techniques when we get into it. Terrorists or potential radicalists, and, and especially pure terrorists, most people, when you say terrorists, uh, tend to think in terms of Islamic terrorism. Well, I think you'll find if you look at prisons throughout the world, most of the people in prison who have been convicted of terrorist activities have not been for Islamic terrorism. It's been for white supremacy, it's been for political activities, it's been for a whole lot of things. And so when we talk about the training of staff, we've got to make sure that they're looking at individuals and at circumstances or classification people have to understand what to look for. And in the chapter, we go through some of the basics. But terrorism is a, um, is a moving, developing art. It changes almost daily and weekly. So about the time we finish training the people in one particular area on um, here's some things we've got to be looking for, the next day it changes. So we've got to build into our training and our policies uh, the ability to change quickly. And those of you who understand prisons know that change in prisons is not something that comes quickly. Uh, we find systems for security, we find systems for programs and training, and we hold on to them dearly. So we change very slowly. So the challenge for, for prisons really has a lot to do with the training the hiring and the vetting of staff. And we have several things in the chapter that, that talk about that. One of the things that has become key in prisons dealing with all offenders, but now especially potential radicals or uh, people who could turn into violent uh, radicals, is um, a supervision method called direct supervision. Prisons have two different ways of supervising people. One is static, and that's what many people are used to when they watch a movie. The guards uh, are in towers, they're walking outside, they've got batons, and the inmates are all inside with the uh, staff looking at them, but not mixing with them. More modern uh, approaches over the last five years and growing much more popular is direct supervision, which means if I'm a guard in a prison and I've got a dormitory with 60 to 70 inmates in it, I'm not on the outside looking through a window at them. I'm in the dormitory with them. I can hear them. I can talk to them. We can see the reaction. And therefore, I'm in a much better position in terms of communication, both to set an example as well as to hear what's going on and, and help direct them towards programming. We have found, and I'll end with this, that where there have been good programs, and there are many throughout the world for working with radicals in prison in terms of rehabilitation, and rehabilitation does not mean getting somebody to disavow their evil thoughts uh, against society. It means getting them to a point where they will no longer use violence to prove their political point. And we found in programs throughout the world, to a very high degree, a great deal of success in keeping people who leave prison from not rejoining the radical groups, either financially 
are by committing violence. So we've got more hope than we've got negative right now. And, and I'll leave with that uh, and be available for questions either now or later on email. Thank you, Thank you, Gary. Thank you for your insights. We will see some changes in the US prison system because the new president uh, pleaded for the abolishment of private prisons, which I think is a good thing. One thing that always struck me when looking at uh, prisons being academies of crime, the recidivism rates for terrorists are in fact much, much lower than for ordinary uh, criminals. Several recent studies, uh, one by Udi Otwitz in the US have uh, shown that. I now pass on uh, to Barbara Sude, who has studied what one could call open air prisons in various parts of the world, uh, refugee camps and asylum centers. And uh, some of these places have been housing people who were born there and spent much of their life there. So the temptation to break out having a gun and explore the world must be quite big. We all are familiar with uh, the Palestinian camps, but there are many more. For instance, in the north of Kenya is one of the biggest in the world, but one time housing uh, half a million, mainly Somali refugees. Barbara has studied uh, these uh, for the US government and later for a think tank, the Rand Corporation. And I'm very grateful that she also contributes a chapter to our book. Barbara, do you have some PowerPoints on this? No, I don't. Uh, I was too lazy to do that, although it might have been handy for one issue here. Um, the, the problem in analyzing how we would prevent terrorism in refugee camps and then also in asylum centers, which was part of the chapter, is that uh, there are two problems. Only a very small minority of refugees ever engage in terrorism. And secondly, the science on counterterrorism, mental health and criminology on why people of any background turn to terrorism is still developing. In addition, we have more information on camps historically than for asylum centers. And the recent information we have, particularly on migrant and asylum centers, is biased toward refugees in Europe, often just since 2015, and when the Syrian um, diaspora began in a large way. And it's biased also toward radicalization of Middle Eastern Muslims and not other groups. A couple of figures are illustrative. The Cato Institute for the United States shows that between 1975 and 2017, of 3.3 million refugees who would, were admitted to the United States, only 25 became terrorists. Only three of those were successful in conducting attacks. For Europe, Sam Mullins of the George C. Marshall Center says that of over 4.5 million applications for asylum between, it's a little bit different here, between 2011, 2017, only 144 people have been credibly accused or convicted of involvement in terrorism. Nevertheless, we have the mantra from many politicians, we have to get lucky all the time, but they only have to get lucky once. So um, pure perfection is what many of our leaders are looking for. And the trauma for victims of, of refugees who did conduct attacks is immeasurable. So how can we deter them? Now to study this issue, when I was at RAND, we took a look at historical camp situations. For example, Palestinians, Af Afghans and Rwandan refugees. In those cases, some refugees radicalized to terrorism or violent militancy. Here I am mixing in a little bit because the data is such that it's difficult to separate terrorism from, but vi joining violent groups. And I think that fits in with the rest of the, uh, the book we're working on, you know, the chapter here. Uh, so if they radicalized to terrorism or violent militancy, and then some people 
in those camps did and some did not. So when we compared those cases, and they were more than just those three, six sets of factors emerged in the cases in which we did see more violent groups develop. And they're not necessarily in order of priority. Host country policies, including administrative and legal restrictions on refugees, security in and around camps, and that included whether the host country was able to police the area, because the host country is usually responsible for security, or whether militants um, took control of security, particularly within the camp. Political and militant organizing among refugees, the type of shelter they had, whether it was a camp and how long they were forced to spend there. Conditions for youth, and this fits in with some of what Thomas was saying, did they have access to meaningful education and employment? And then finally, local economic conditions and resilience because we have found that when the local community surrounding the camp um, is uh, impoverished and believes the refugees are receiving more goods than they are, they will often oppose them and create violence themselves outside the camps. Now, in recent years, the international community, including UNHCR, has recognized many of these risks and taken steps in the last decade or so to mitigate them. Camps are increasingly rare for one thing, only 40% of refugees are in camps. As, and refugees are receiving economic support to settle among local populations globally. For Syrian refugees in the Middle East, the new, apologies, new policies have emerged in documents like the annual regional refugee and resilience plans, or they're called 3RP. Notably, the focus on resilience hopes to bring host government and populations on board through, for example, infrastructure and economic improvements to be shared between refugees and local people. Nonetheless, of course, as we well know, local populations may still be reluctant to welcome refugees. Now for asylum centers, whether under international NGO or government offices, the idea is to hold refugees for a status decision or prepare them to integrate with local populations. And it's supposed to be very short term. But as in the camps, many of these asylum uh, stays last a very long time with the person in limbo wondering what the decision is going to be. And I won't go into what the United States was doing recently on the Mexican border, but that creates frustrations and can lead to trouble. Now in asylum centers, the radicalization risk factors are somewhat comparable to what we found in camps and even more similar to what we've seen in urban resettlement such as in the Middle East. The difference is that refugees in asylum centers, especially when they have been given word that they will be able to integrate in the community have greater expectation of establishing a permanent new home and that's a potential mitigating factor for radicalization. However, the move into permanent housing and integration into schools and businesses also pose risk of radicalization to refugees, particularly if the local environment is hostile. This is where individual, personal, and psychological factors affect risk assessment and prevention efforts. Now, this is where I turn to whether the science can keep up uh, including the, uh, in the science to identify people who are at risk of terrorism and the science on ways to mitigate it. Um, let's see if this is, uh, it's still pretty vague. Are refugees at greater risk of radicalization than non-refugees is one question, especially for local officials who are deciding what to do. Almost all refugees have had to cope with a major change. Of course, they've left their homes. Some have had to cope with personal failure or loss of status. We found that many doctors, nurses, teachers, they had high qualifications, but when they, when they fled their country, they lost all their documentation or they were not allowed to work if they did have something. And, some, and many suffer PTSD from violent trauma. They often face social isolation and discrimination within the new community. 
young people may be particularly vulnerable. And, but, and all of these factors have been flagged as long-term risk factors for terrorism. Yet, we don't see large numbers of refugees becoming radicalized and even fewer committing terrorist attacks. Fortunately, several intervention programs developed for non-refugees at risk for violence show promise for addressing such psychosocial issues. One example was um, cognitive behavioral therapy for trauma in schools, which uh, has a program, many students, not, you know, not refugees included, non-refugees included, have suffered significant trauma and they have very great difficulty in school. Um, but this program has been developed so that in the newer iterations of it, at least, um, teachers don't have, uh, they don't have, don't have to hire a psychologist or psychiatrist, which would be very expensive for schools to do. They are trained in how to deal with the trauma themselves. To lessen the chances though, that even a minority will radicalize, local, national, and international stakeholders must continue to impl imp implement comprehensive policies and funding, this is of course always an issue, to address these perennial risk factors. Ensuring that local laws back to host environment don't intentionally or unintentionally keep refugees from finding stable homes, jobs, and education. Some places you weren't allowed to engage in higher education, for example. Protecting refugees from violent attacks and discrimination. Preventing radicalizer access or control in asylum centers and camps. And that includes, as Thomas was mentioning, programs to allow refugees to um, control their own environment, to elect their own officials within a camp, for example. Facilitating refugees' transition to permanent housing and providing psychosocial counseling, education, and meaningful employment, particularly for youth. And finally, ensuring that local populations are included in these assistance programs. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, for sharing your insights uh, on uh, asylum centers and refugee uh, centers as sources of uh, potential political violence. There are more than 70 million internally displaced persons and uh, refugees in the world. So this issue is one uh, that is often politicized, not based on facts, but based on uh, witch hunts. I hope that uh, in your country, this will be less now you have a uh, more liberal president. Alexander has said that we should make a little break after the first three chapters have been discussed and listen to questions that uh, might come from the audience, an audience that has in the meantime increased to 75 people. So I turn it to uh, Antoinette and ask her whether she has received any questions. And if not, they might direct it to her and she can monitor that part. Antoinette, are you still with us? Sure, Professor Schmidt, I can actually pick that up. There have been a couple questions and I would encourage folks to continue to ask them. I am just gonna ask a couple here in the interest of time to make sure we get the chance to speak, uh, to hear from the remaining three uh, contributors here. Um, so uh, I think I wanted to direct the first question uh, back to Thomas. It was one that came up uh, regarding the role of student exchange programs, and I think speaks to this larger question of contact and should more contact in theory uh, improve the or reduce the risk of radicalization. And uh, this question is uh, focused on the fact that in fact, exchange programs can in some instances, uh, or the, the question is, have exchange programs proven to be effective at reducing the risk of radicalization? Um, can you comment on them? Or in fact, are they in some instances uh, exacerbating sort of the uh, disparities and therefore potentially driving radicalization once you see what other um, societies, ways of, of, uh, of living and, and ideas about your own culture or society actually look like in, in person? 
Yeah, um, thank you for the question. So uh, we had an instance one, once where we had a, a student from this region, from the Southeast Asian re region who went for a student exchange program. Um, and he came back uh, filled with ideas of Marxism and wanting to, to start a revolution. And so the authorities of that particular country came back to me and said, Thomas, could you just help us out? And one of the reasons was simply because this, this young teenager, he was uh, only around 14 years old, he only heard one side of the story. So when we do programs like student exchange programs, especially when they do go out of the country, it's important to have uh, some form of briefing, uh, some form of uh, uh, awareness program so that they know what they're going into. The reason why student exchange programs are very positive because sometimes um, many young people, particularly from this part of the world, they say that, look, they want to go to Syria because they want to do something good. And the only opportunity to do so is to actually heed the invitation of the terrorist organization. Whereas if you can actually have programs in which you can actually go to certain countries and perhaps volunteer, whether it's through Doctors Without Borders or ICRC, there is a potential where young people can feel that they are able to do something without having to resort to things like uh, um, terrorism or extremism. So that's the idea also of student exchange programs. It's to, uh, in the ability to volunteer, to make something significant of your life, uh, to do something significant that can give you that sense of value and thereby take uh, the, the potential of a terrorist offering you the same invitation. Super, um, yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry, Alex, did you want to, did you want to add something? No, I just thought uh, you monitor the Q and A. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I, I'm. Uh, I think I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold a couple other questions that have come in. I'm going to hand the floor back to the the rest of the panelists, and then that should hopefully leave us five or ten minutes at the back end to pick up some other questions. So apologies for those who have asked. Uh, we will try to get back to uh, back to it, but to keep uh, moving forward. I'll um, I'll uh, encourage the next uh, chapter to to open up here. Well, the next chapter would be a chapter co-authored by Asad Ullah Khan and Ifra Bakar. I have seen Ifra Bakar on the screen. Uh, maybe uh, Asad Ullah Khan also managed to, to join us, but I understand that Ifra Bakar will present the findings about radicalization in religious schools, looking at the efforts of her country to uh, curb these. You have the word, please. Do you have PowerPoints? Uh, yes, I do. Okay, then Antoinette, can you take care of these? Good evening, sir. I'm also here. Asim. Okay, glad to see you. Thank you, thank you. Um, shall I begin? Okay, yeah. Yeah, please, yeah. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, I'm Ifra Bakar. First of all, I would like to extend uh, my co-author and I's heartfelt gratitude to Professor Schmidt and the ICC team for their continued cooperation. Uh, today, I will be presenting on preventing terrorism from students of extremist madrasas and overview of Pakistan's efforts. Next slide, please. Now, I became personally invested and interested in this topic while I was working on the CVE initiatives in Pakistan post the 2014 army public school attack in Peshawar because it was and it continues to be such a con contentious topic and there are many misconceptions regarding the role of madrasa, the religious seminaries and the popular narrative regarding uh, the said uh, religious seminaries that exist and it is important to counter them. Uh, please, next slide please. Uh, madrasas historically have held a very important position in the Islamic society and similarly in the subcontinent uh, they held a very important position uh, because the madrasas they played a very important role in the independence of Pakistan movement in 1947. Uh, it is very important to note that uh, at the time of independence there were 247 madrasas that existed uh, in the country. Until 1975 their role was uh, relatively seen as peaceful and it provided welfare services for the children of the economically downtrodden uh, people. However, their rules started changing uh, post the 80s with the Afghan war and the impact on Pakistan. Uh, according to Pakistan's official figures, there are more than 30,000 madrasas currently operating within the country. However, according to a study made by a private think tank, there are 37,517 uh, madrasas that currently exist in the country. Uh, next slide, please. 
Now, as I said before, madrasas have had have held an important position at, at, and, and been considered a seat of learning. They have been supporting the socioeconomically vulnerable segment of society. However, it cannot be denied that uh, they have been sometimes used as a tool in the name of religion by their donors and by the institutions of the state. Uh, one important thing that I wanted to make uh, uh, and wanted to emphasize on that they are not entirely charity-based organizations. Some madrasas, some religious seminaries do make investments for, for profit and uh, they are profit-based organizations. Uh, next slide, please. While we look at the madrasa system, it was very important to analyze the curriculum that is being taught in the madrasas. For it, uh, the madrasa that exists in Pakistan, they mainly belong to two sects of Islam, that is Sunni and Shia. They come under five federally recognized educational uh, independent boards, and these five constituent boards together form the Union of the Religious Educational Organizations. That is the ultimate body that deals with the governments whenever negotiation over madrasas uh, happens between the government officials and these madrasas. Now, the curriculum uh, being taught in the madrasas is known as Dars Nizami. It is a 500 years old curriculum. It was developed by Mullah Nizamuddin Sahalvi, an 18th century scholar of the Farangi Mahal Madrasa, uh, which is located in modern day uh, Lucknow, India. Next slide, please. While we analyze the curriculum uh, of uh, the, uh, while we analyze this curriculum, we learned that uh, because Arabic is a foreign language, it is not a lo local language, the biggest point was that the students are unable to understand the Arabic language and they often rely on the texted, on the uh, interpreted translations, which in turn leads to a rigid interpretation because it depends on what uh, translated version they are studying. And it can uh, result in hate speech and radicalization tendencies, which then becomes a big uh, issue for the state. Uh, it, focuses on root learning, as I said, because Arabic is not a local language. Uh, one important thing to note is that the link of madrasas and politics, because a lot of political parties, religious political parties in Pakistan, they do have their own network of madrasas where they teach their own political leanings within the garb of the education system, which again leads to not only animosity but towards other schools of thought. For example, this is a Sunni madrasa, there's a Shia madrasa, they might teach uh, uh, points of contention, a uh, hate speech against the other school of thought. And it then again leads to uh, hate speech and radicalization tendencies and deviates the students from the original purpose of learning. And another point that uh, because previously uh, the, there was no equivalency system that existed between the madrasa students who graduated uh, them and the formal education system. So they, the students who graduated, they had extremely limited opportunities. They were unable to integrate into the society, which further led, led to the widening of Kazam of the socioeconomic system in the society and uh, other uh, problems. Uh, please, next slide, please. Uh, as you can see, the madrasa reforms since, 19, it has a, since 1999, it has a common misperception that Pakistan started its strive for the uh, reforms in religious seminaries after the events of 9-11. It is not true. These events predate the events of 9-11. Uh, you can read the detail in the paper uh, due to the lack of time. I don't have time to go into every detail. But what is important to note is that serious work in Pakistan on uh, madrasa reforms was started after the national action plan of 2014. Next slide, please. Now, the problems in streamlining madrasas, the biggest of them being the financial uh, by being the financial one ensuring uh, finance of these madrasas the former uh, military spokesperson uh, major general asif wafur uh, in 2019 said that cash was being diverted from anti terrorism operations in pakistan to these madrasas in order to bring them under the ambit of the state and to regulate them to to their curriculum uh, apart from that uh, the political religious opposition has been there, which has been a hurdle in streamlining madrasas because the conservative sections of society see it uh, as, as the way of state meddling in religious affairs, which they say that it is not uh, acceptable. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, just uh, one thing when we did this study was, uh, it was an important fact and it was an interesting fact to note that no major attack has been carried out in the West that can be traced back to anybody who has attended a Pakistani madrasa. Rather, 
the the Pakistani madrasas they have been involved in domestic sectarian violence, but not uh, in uh, carrying out an attack on, on the West. But uh, is a common misperception that some may have held uh, before this. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, when we look at the uh, overview of Pakistan's counter-terrorism -ter strategies regarding madrasa reforms, there are three important policy documents that come to the forefront. The first of them being the National Internal Security Policy of 2014 to 2018. This 64 policy, this 64 point policy paper was the first one to note that the madrasas could not be excluded from the national internal security parameters, and it included a number of uh, policy uh, uh, recommendations. The second one was the National Action Plan, the 20-point National Action Plan. Madrasa reforms were the point number 10 uh, in the policy paper. The third one was the National Internal Security Policy 2018 to 23. This policy document basically noted that 90% of the madrasas in the country have been successfully geotagged by the government ever since the reform process uh, started, among other recommendations, which I would again, if you can refer to the paper, these all of them are mentioned there. Uh, next slide, please. When we look at the evaluation of the counter strategies, the biggest of them was uh, the effective uh, strengthening and formation of the National Counterterrorism Authority, NECTA. Uh, it was given the implementation policy and it largely was successful in implementing those, especially regarding the madrasa data and registration forms. The second point was very important. It was the curriculum and equivalence mechanism that the madrasa degrees of a certain level, uh, they asked them, uh, the union asked to be they should be given equivalence mechanism by the Higher Education Commission of Pakistan and the Federal uh, Board of Education. The negotiations between the union and the government are, are currently ongoing. However, it was important to note that the, there were certain broad generic targets uh, that were included in the policy paper, especially the National Internal Security Policy, to turn them into goal-oriented and task-specific measures on the ground to achieve concrete results rather than just leave them hanging on the policy uh, as just a policy uh, suggestion. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as I said before, madrasas have historically in, ha held a significant position um, in the development of the socioeconomic fiber of the country. Yes, problems do exist, but madrasas should not be ostracized for the sake of being madrasas. Rather, uh, they should be restored, the, the problems should be looked into and they should be restored to their original status as educational institutions, which is the need of the hour. Thank you. And I would once again like to thank Professor Schmidt and the ICC team for their cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Ifra Bakar. Maybe your colleague Asadullah Khan would like to add something to your remarks. Can he hear us? Uh, yes, sir, sure. Uh, actually, uh, the problem uh, in Pakistan of dealing with madrasa is, uh, is very complicated uh, because of the political factor uh, that is impinging us. Uh, over here in Pakistan, uh, the, the major religious political parties are basically the the owner of the nine, uh, the, the, or I can say the major shareholder of the whole madrasa system in Pakistan. Uh, so, so, uh, so dealing it or you know uh, totally overhauling it is a challenge for any any of the government that has remained, whether it is a military or or the democratic government, uh, um, is a uh, is a is a uh, big issue uh, because because they are not able to handle it wisely. Now, you'll be uh, uh, amazed to listen that uh, 2014 was the point uh, where every political party, every stakeholder of the society, after APS attack, army public school attack, uh, uh, came on, on, on a single page and they agreed that there should be a reform uh, in the form of a national action plan in which madrasa reform is the one part uh, in, in the society so that we can get rid of this issue of terrorism. And you'll also be um, amazed to listen that uh, before 2014, there was no central uh, intelligence sharing mechanism in the country. So how will you uh, uh, deal with uh, any, any of the terrorist plan that has been planned in Peshawar 
and will be executed in Karachi the next day. So there was no uh, intelligence sharing mechanism between our security forces. That was also established after 2014. Uh, so the work on mad madrasa reforms after 2014 in such a short span of time uh, is, I say, um, amazing because the geotagging of madrasas has been completed. Uh, government has now record of complete uh, who is teaching in which madrasa, how many number of students are uh, living there or taking education over there. Now they are talking about uh, the madrasa uh, curriculum reforms, the education reforms. Uh, so one may think that like what can be uh, the, uh, the shortest possible solution for the madrasa uh, reforms. I believe, and I have discussed this uh, in many uh, government um, uh, meetings as well to the, to the relevant uh, policy makers as well, I suggested it to them, that we can bring them uh, under, under the rules of NGOs working in our country. We can hold accountable madrasas under the rules of NGOs. Like whatever rules we are uh, 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 applying on the NGOs who are operating, we can apply them on the uh, madrasas as well. And then obviously what rules we are applying on our educational institution, uh, we can apply them curriculum wise on our madrasas. So this is, I believe, the uh, I, I have, at least I have, this, uh, the, the shortest possible solution uh, at the moment. And yes, the political will is again a question mark uh, and uh, that needs to be looked at. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Alex Smid. Uh, and thank you uh, everyone for listening to us. Uh, it's a great opportunity to work for ICST and I hope we will work together in future as well. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, these additional informations were very helpful. The devil is of was in the implementation. While the insights might be there and solutions can be sketched, uh, implementation uh, remains a problem, uh, not only in your country. We now turn uh, to uh, Nina Kaiserhage, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Rostock, uh, focusing on religious studies. She has uh, studied uh, Salafist groups in Germany in her dissertation and is now working on a major work on women and children in uh, the radical milieu. Nina will, uh, has written nine uh, case studies of which uh, only five made it into the handbook uh, because uh, the size was uh, too much, but they have been a published apart by the Lit Verlag in Zurich. So Nina, please summarize some of the findings of your case studies. The word is yours. Thank you very much, dear Alex. And uh, thank you very much, um, dear colleagues from the ICCT and also uh, my fellow colleagues over there and um, the participants. Um, so today I would like to present you some aspects of uh, chapter 11, the prevention of radicalization in Western Muslim diasporas. And um, maybe we could start with the first slide, please. Thank you. So uh, the starting point in view of my chapter was the fact that a lot of Western countries uh, seem to struggle in view of concepts or terms such as radicalization. Different understandings of radicalization become significant in the context of selecting best approaches to strengthen uh, prevention efforts. So if a starting point related to a phenomenon like radicalization differs, efforts to achieve common aims are likely to run into difficulties. A term like, for example, Muslim diaspora can be meant as a neutral description of a religious minority, but can also be understood um, as excluding a whole segment of a minority group from society, even those persons who were born in the West. These effects of um, such an othering religion um, as the Islam in largely secular states, for instance, related to domestic political debates could be seen as a key for some Muslim to embrace radical religious thoughts. The increase of anti-Muslim acts and anti-Muslim racism in the West is often fueled by media reports portraying a whole religion as violent. 
it can also be seen as co-responsible for the solidarization or rather radicalization of some young and vulnerable Muslims across Europe, with radicalization being a form of protest. According to the um, Islamophobia report 2018, that is based on service in uh, 34 European countries, Islamophobic incidents and cases related to religion increased since 2017, and the rise of the number of attacks on Muslim women who wear a real variant has been observed. This gendered, so-called gendered Islamophobia, could be seen as a specific discrimination towards female believers because women are still seen in public as the major responsibles for the education of the next generation whom the so-called defenders of the Occident prefer to see as secular or non-Muslim as possible. Tragically and ironically at the same time, the pressure on Muslim women in Western Muslim diasporas in the name of freedom might be equal to the pressure they experience from radical Islamic environments or from their conservative families. Therefore, this aspect should be seen as one of the major approaches within the prevention work related to violent extremism, because we can also um, observe it in view of white supremacy groups as well. On the international and regional level, some key developments related to the topic radicalization could, for example, be seen um, in the United Nations Plan of Action to Prevent Violent Extremism, launched in the year two, uh, 2015 by the General Assembly, or, for example, by UNESCO's um, Scientific and Cultural Preventing Violent Extremism Through Education, a Guide for Policymakers report, launched in 2017. And also additionally, um, in uh, the uh, European Council's conclusions on EU external action on preventing and countering terrorism and violent extremism in 2020. Next slide, please. In my chapter, I um, examined the CPVE developments in Belgium, Canada, Denmark, France, Germany, and Great Britain. In a first step, the national situation related to the existence and development of left, right-wing, and radical Islamic movements is illustrated to give a brief overview about the current situation regarding these three milieus. In a second step, a short summary was given in view of the earlier and the present governmental efforts and new directions and challenges in the field of prevention of radicalization and violent extremism um, which are addressed, illustrated by references to various national, regional, and subject-specific approaches. In order to provide a brief state of the art, according to the literature related to radicalization in the selected five countries and possible approaches to prevent further radicalization, a few publications are discussed that could be seen as a kind of representative for each country. In a last step, um, the so-called unique selling point of the national CPVE strategy is highlighted in order to provide an overview of valuable approaches. For instance, in view of Germany, uh, the PVE programs focus more on knowledge transfer and educational work in the primary prevention, whereas France's approach is more repressive. This approach should provide the possibility for each country to overthink its approaches and maybe change some of their path in order to improve the national strategies of prevention and have to avoid further radicalization. Next slide, please. Coming to a few results related to the aforementioned country reports in view of their CPVE efforts, one of the findings is the fact that strict law enforcement and labeling of Muslims as potential national enemies did not bring a decline in radicalization or a greater identification of diaspora members with the cultural and political values of Western host city, uh, societies. Pardon. But it led to new waves of clashes with the host country's traditional values and new forms of radicalization and further attacks. The old truism that violence begets violence became true again for instance, in France, where a special armed police unit uh, such as the Sentinelle 
were seen as provocation by some members of the Muslim communities. Terrorist attacks in Britain could not all be prevented by the extensive public surveillance put in place, but seemed to provoke or even worse to attract some of the media addicted jihadis who wished to see themselves being videotaped um, taped, pardon, during their attacks in order to become famous in the online jihadi uh, scene. The idea of monitoring one section of the public and inviting citizens to report on their neighbors' activities, like for instance, practiced in Belgium or in the Netherlands, leaves a bitter taste, especially to those countries which experienced fascist rule in the not too distant past. While the idea to prevent terrorist attacks with the help of civil society involvement and citizens' awareness of radicalization symptoms in their neighborhood is based on good intentions and can be made to work as exemplified uh, by the Danish Aarhus model. Um, it is double-edged, um, it is now a double-edged sword at the same time, because it can also lead to greater mistrust between host society and diasporas, fan religion-based prejudice, and provoke vigilantism in the form of right-wing racist action. Radicalization does not come out of the blue, we all know it, but it is, in the majority of the cases, the result of persistent discrimination, deprivation, and the absence of social and political participation. Successful PVA models respond to actual needs by combining, and this is really a major um, result of my research, by combining uh, religious social, psychological, academical, and uh, criminolo criminological um, expertise. In addition to uh, the cooperation of these experts, uh, such as street workers and practitioners uh, from other kinds of areas, um, it would only be wise to include individual police officers who are well known and trusted within the community. A last aspect I would like to highlight is the absence of a common legal understanding of radicalization and extremism within Europe. This situation has led to diverse penalties for those considered radicalized and extremist and has various social and political consequences, for instance, in view of the question of the reintegration of farmers into their societies. Therefore, and in accordance with um, the European Union's external action on preventing and countering terrorism and violent extremism from June 2020. The cooperation between the different EU countries regarding the internal and external dimensions of counterterrorism and prevention should be strengthened in order to build more effective, uh, effective synergies between those countries. Thank you very much for your... Okay. Thank you, Nina, Thank you. for summarizing your large chapter. Well done. We now turn uh, to Sarah Zeiger, who has written together with Joseph Gaiti a long chapter on uh, the role of social media and the internet in general in radicalization and the prevention of radicalization the offline world and the online world become increasingly uh, integrated and uh, she will tell us more about the relationship between this. Sarah, do you have PowerPoints? I do, I think they're pulling it up right now, so. Um, thank you, I see them online. Okay, yours the word. Thank you very much. So thank you, uh, first of all, to um, ICCT and, and to you, Alex, for inviting uh, us to contribute to, uh, to this very important edited volume that you put together, um, a very impressive list of experts. So we're honored to be part of, of that group. Um, and so I think, secondly, I uh, can't write a chapter on uh, social media without giving myself a shout out. You can follow me on social media at Sarah Zeiger um, on Twitter and my colleague Joe Geit, at Joe Geit, also on uh, Twitter. Um, we're also available to connect on LinkedIn. So um, that being said, this chapter, um, for those of you who study intensively uh, radicalization online, we're not saying anything new or innovative, um, but rather we just took a, a sort of a summary or a survey of the various methods that terrorist groups use um, on the internet and social media 
and then uh, offered some possible solutions, some possible responses and areas for prevention, for terrorism prevention. Um, so it's, it's uh, not surprising for me to say that um, terrorism, terrorist groups have become more dispersed. There, there's more globalized networks um, than before uh, because of the internet and social media and ideas spread uh, more rapidly, uh, partially because of an increased volume and diversity of both the messages and available platforms to spread terrorist content. Um, so if you wanna go to the first slide, um, the first part of our chapter essentially highlighted um, a number of different uh, methods that terrorist groups use um, online and on social media. Um, none of these again are going to be a surprise. There's of course uh, videos being promoted on, on YouTube, images, magazines. So of course uh, everyone's familiar with Dabek, uh, which is on the slide here. Um, also Gaydi Mitani, which is the um, Al-Shabaab's uh, magazine online inspired by Al-Qaeda. Um, also to highlight um, the use of video games. Um, I think that this is actually going to be a, an emerging topic that should be studied more. Um, but just the example of the clanging of the swords video game that was promoted by ISIS uh, a couple of years ago, a first person shooter game that um, got some credibility online um, before it was taken down. Um, and then of course the social networks and social media um, give opportunities for individuals uh, that are part of terrorist groups to share their own personal stories. Um, and this makes terrorism somehow more accessible to, to the everyday person, which is a problem for prevention and preventing radicalization. So we gave the example of um, Aksa Mahmoud, who is a Scottish um, lady who traveled to, 19 years old, who traveled to Syria, and she was using her social media accounts to promote positive visions of what it was like to be part of the Islamic State um, in Syria, and uh, until her uh, accounts were eventually blocked by the British authorities. Um, but she provided a glimpse into the everyday life that um, in, a, in a way that was appealing to others and certainly radicalized more individuals because of it. Um, and then of course we have the live streaming function now. Um, I believe this is actually being live streamed on YouTube at the moment. And um, that has presented challenges we saw with the Christchurch attack um, on mosques in, in a couple of years ago. The attack was live streamed for 17 minutes um, before it was, it was taken down. Um, and then the, there was millions of, of copies of the video that was circulated online uh, before they were taken down by Facebook and, and others. Um, just to highlight a couple of more points that weren't in the chapter because we you know, pretty much finalized the, the text of this chapter um, towards our early of, of last year. Um, but I think two more important events have kind of happened that uh, just raised the, the need for the more study of this topic to, to my mind. And that's the first one is obviously the COVID-19 pandemic and just the spread of misinformation and disinformation online and the connection between uh, conspiracy theories and, and the spread of that information. And um, after, shortly after the COVID-19 pandemic came out, there was terrorist groups, for example, in Indonesia that were referencing um, anti-Chinese rhetoric that actually uh, manifested in, in attacks against Chinese workers in, in Indonesia. So um, it has very real consequences. Um, and then of course, the, the more recent attacks um, on the US Capitol, uh, it's no surprise that uh, social media was a big influencer in, in spreading um, potentially radicalizing those individuals. And uh, for example, there was a live tweeting of the Speaker of the House's uh, movements that obviously has security implications. So there's many, many challenges when it comes to the terrorist use of the internet and, and social media. Um, again, none of these are surprises to anyone who studied this, um, but you can go to the next slide. So what can we do about that? Um, we highlighted a couple of different options in, in our chapter, um, we talked about smart uh, regulation and, and smart legislation. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight, for example, the EU came out with new regulations in 2019, um, which was a good first step towards uh, better uh, regulating the space. Um, but I've, I noticed that there's not always a full understanding of what, um, what needs to be regulated in the online space and how to go about that regulation. So for example, there was a sort of misunderstanding of the hash database that was developed by the Global Internet Forum to Counterterrorism, GIFCT, um, which uh, was shared between, at the time, the four main social media companies. Um, and 
uh, the, the new regulations didn't quite fully comprehend what the capabilities were in terms of artificial intelligence. And that had limitations when it came to the actual regulations that came out. So um, making sure that there's a conversation with social media companies and uh, that the regulation is addressing the issues that are needed both for security and also for the private sector. Um, of course, the second strategy around blocking content and taking down content. So um, there's, for example, uh, Sri Lanka, the Sri Lankan government immediately after the attacks in 2019 blocked Facebook, YouTube, uh, Instagram, WhatsApp. Um, and that had a, a short term effect of at least preventing further spread of, of radicalizing ideas online and misinformation about what was happening uh, during the attack. So it can have some short term effects and it can be uh, useful, especially in, in times of, of crises. Um, but then also more long-term solutions like uh, taking down specific items of uh, specific content, uh, images, videos, um, and then also uh, taking down full accounts um, on social media. Um, but we always run into the issue that we can never take down all of that material. So um, we're always going to miss things. Um, so we need to get better and more efficient at content takedown and to, to use the available, for example, artificial intelligence tools. Um, that can help us do that, but that can't be the only solution to preventing the radicalization online. Um, so the, the third one I wanted to highlight, the third strategy I wanted to highlight was on countering terrorist narratives. Um, this can include deconstructing terrorist narratives. It can also include delegitimizing de um, the, the terrorist groups actions, for example, uh, pointing out hypocrisies using hu humor. Um, and also positive and alternative actions um, that can help address grievances, but at the same time promote um, a more positive or maybe democratic uh, solution to the challenges that people are facing. And uh, I know Alex is quite well versed in counter narratives. Um, so I'm sure he'll have additional questions for me on that one. But um, that's, a, you know, in summary, the, the main points there. But I did want to highlight uh, one particular case study that we pointed out in our chapter, which is um, uh, of a positive narrative, which is uh, Anataban, which is a group in, um, in South Sudan who were promoting videos, uh, music videos um, online that were uh, aimed to, to, they were saying that the, they were tired, they were tired of the, the violence, they were tired of, tired of the conflict, and they wanted to create a youth movement um, that was promoting positive and, and peaceful solutions to the conflict. Um, so if you get a chance to check them out on YouTube, um, Anna Tabon is the name and it's, they have some very cool videos uh, that they made. Um, so then the final fourth and final strategy uh, to mention is build, building digital resilience and media literacy. And this ties into some of the earlier conversations around education and just making sure that um, students, teachers, young people are able to filter through the information that they receive online to, to challenge misinformation and disinformation and to um, think about uh, the messages they're receiving and, and what the intention is behind those messages. Um, and I think that there's a lot of tools that are already available through, for example, UNESCO has come up a few times. Um, also the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change um, has some resources for teachers, for example, that focus on, on building digital resilience. Um, so there are, there are uh, tools already out there. So you can go to the next slide. So just to wrap up a couple of recommendations that I've been thinking about with respect to this chapter. Um, I mentioned before, partnering with the private sector companies is incredibly important to prevent radicalization online. Um, we need to know how those social media companies are working. Uh, we need to create legislation that addresses security needs, but also provides uh, appropriate guidance to those, that private sector that leverages the available artificial intelligence uh, tools for content takedown and the dilution of terrorist narratives. Um, and also to work on with the social media companies to strategize on how to spread positive and, and counter messages online on their platforms. Um, I think uh, Alex, you may have mentioned this is very important, combining online counter narrative strategies with offline actions. Um, and that means knowing your target audience and adapting the message to appeal to their wants and needs. Um, and promoting counter and alternative messages that actively engage with that audience, including face-to-face. -face. And maybe in the time of COVID, it's face-to-face -face on Zoom. But I think it's very, very important that uh, we have campaigns online that also take the conversation offline. That's how the recruiting is happening. So that's how the counter recruiting should also happen. 
And then finally, pr uh, promoting media and information literacy to build that digital resilience to violent extremist propaganda is uh, in the nexus between this and education for me is, is absolutely critical. And I think we can learn a lot from the experiences of the COVID-19 pandemic and the recent US elections on how to prevent misinformation from spreading and conspiracy theories and apply it to the context of, of countering violent extremism and terrorism. Um, and then I think also just making sure we're involving that education sector to build the capacities of students, as I mentioned, um, and how to, to filter and engage with information online. So that's all I have to say. Um, it's a, a lot of information in a, in a short period of time, um, but hopefully you're able to read the chapter and I'm looking forward to the questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, for summarizing your chapter, the one that you use with Joseph Gaiti. Uh, we all are impressed by the work that you and your colleagues do at Hedaya for many years now. And we hope that one day we will be uh, invited physically to come uh, to your campus again. I see Alexander van Rosenbach uh, on the screen, so I invite him uh, to uh, supervise and monitor the Q&A. We have seven questions, if I see it correctly. Can you go through these? Sure, yeah. I just wanted to firstly say thanks to everyone who has spoken today. I know we are already over time, as was budgeted, so thanks a for those who have listened and stick with us, I do see that we have a still a pretty strong constituency, so that is really great. I think it would be sensible to try and uh, carry the, the conversation forward for a few minutes here, um, uh, because yeah, I mean, I'm, and I'm just madly taking notes as we've been through the last hour, and I would love to allow those who have uh, done the same on their end at home, uh, mostly to do so. Um, I wanted to start with a question that comes back to uh, Barbara. Uh, to speak a little bit, if you can, about the differentiating between sort of criminal acts in refugee camps and terrorist attacks, uh, or arguably in the uh, sphere of radicalization, uh, radicalization towards uh, terrorist groups and ideas versus sort of pull of organized gangs or other criminal organizations in those communities. Is there, uh, um, are there methods to help differentiate those in terms of sort of understanding or responding to them? Well, I think we're getting into uh, what the difference, what terrorism is, the definition of terrorism. Uh, but uh, the criminal acts are something that camps and other situations had to cope with for a long time. They haven't necessarily been able to control them. The camp administrators try to prevent this uh, uh, gender-based violence, um, other kinds of criminality, um, uh, fights and theft. Those are different than terrorism. They don't have an ideological motive or a political motive, but you can get militant groups who are in the camp. And um, as I said, like with the Rwandan refugees, they were Hutus who um, after having conducted the uh, genocide fled to Zaire and the militant groups were not separated from the main body of refugees, and they were allowed to gain control of some of the distribution of relief supplies and the like in the camp. So they could radicalize people because they had greater access and they could also um, insist that someone cooperate with them in order to get food and the like. So that would be an example of terrorism or militant group having control. But we're not seeing much today. We do have rumors that terrorism has come out of camps, for example, in Kenya with the um, Somali refugees at Dadaab camp, but that has not been verified. And it turned out that most of the attackers, for example, on a university campus and at a shopping mall in the last decade or so were conducted by Kenyan and, or Tanzanian citizens and not by refugees. So um, it, there's been better control in recent years also of who enters camps such as in Jordan among Syrian refugees. I'll just leave it at that because you have other questions. 
Super, yeah, thanks for that. Um, and indeed, I mean, uh, these questions and more, I think, do, do get some more treatment in all of these chapters. So uh, yeah, what we have done in eight minutes per person doesn't do justice to, to the conversations that you can pick up uh, if you do go to ICCT's website and find these excellent works. Um, I had another question regarding, uh, well, several questions grouped around sort of the uh, the last presentation, and particularly the sensitivity around the role of social media companies, it's a question that comes up anytime you deal with strategic communications at ICCT. We do sit at the table with GCT and Facebook and Twitter, and obviously Hedaya does, and many other organizations as well. And this question continues to come to the fore of how much, I guess, accountability can we expect from them? How much regulation can we place upon them? Um, and uh, how much are those efforts uh, at the sort of the cutting edge of uh, technology, um, indeed mostly not understood by anyone in a policy or sort of lay setting, uh, or how can we connect them to sort of the EU strategies, the uh, global UN compacts? How do we connect that fast moving pace of, of where the threat really is online with the sort of slower moving institutional uh, agendas that, that take consensus to build. So Sarah, that, that question is aimed obviously for you. So I'll uh, give you back the floor. Thank you. Yeah, that's a difficult question. Um, and it's a conversation that we, we have at Hidaya, as you said, at ICCT as well, quite frequently. Um, I think there was a question on the, on the uh, Q&A panel around the recent takedown of Donald Trump's um, Twitter account. And so I won't necessarily speak directly to that, but um, in terms of um, should or, or, well, should social media companies um, be responsible for taking down these accounts? Um, I think it's a very challenging question. And this is where I come back to creating smart regulation that is in conversation with social media companies that addresses security challenges, but also addresses the needs and wants of the private sector. Um, because I think legally speaking, most of these companies are private companies and so they have their own policies and they're able to take down people's accounts when it follows their, it's in violation of their own policies. But I think there's an ethical question around, uh, especially when it comes to some of these social media giants such as, as Facebook and Twitter, Microsoft, Google, who have a, a large platform of, of followers and a lot of power when it comes to um, what information is shared online. And so um, that ethical question, I think, is what a lot of people um, struggle with. And, and uh, that's where the challenge lies, is how, how much can you regulate and how little can you regulate? And I think there is evidence where even if you're taking down content, at least from uh, when it comes to terrorist content, when you're taking down content, um, it shows up elsewhere. Uh, there's plenty of other platforms where those terrorist groups migrate to. So again, content takedown alone is not, and blocking accounts is not sufficient. Um, as a solution. Um, but I think that legislation needs to do a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I think there needs to be clear roles and responsibilities between the government that's legislating and the private sector um, that has policies on content takedown. Um, and I think that those, those roles and responsibilities are not always clearly defined. Um, there sometimes tends to be a lot of finger pointing from the governments at the social media companies um, and expectations of taking down content immediately. Um, but at the same time, the lack of understanding of how how much effort and how much um, uh, time may be required to take down that content, for example. Um, and I think an another thing that I've heard when it comes to conversations with social media companies, they said that there's not a clear definition of the line of what it means to be terrorist content and not terrorist content. And um, so I know we talked at the very beginning, Alex, of definitions, and there's not a universal definition. But at the same time, uh, when it comes to legislation and when it comes to laws, there needs to be a clear definition so that the social media companies can follow that law and make sure that they're in compliance um, with content takedown, uh, both in alignment with their own policies, but also legally. Uh, so those are just some thoughts on, on that subject. Yeah, super. No, that, that's a super interesting one. And what I think you see, at least in the European context, is uh, that there's indeed an increasing effort to to try and get uh, sort of the national governments to help define what it is, or to even further to actually have a responsibility to flag content first. And then, of course, you get obligations to take that down. So some potential for public-private partnership to, to work a bit more effectively. But I do think uh, it's a, a continuous challenge. 
Uh, I wanted to turn quickly to Ifra, um, because one of the things that you mentioned in your conversation uh, about the lessons from Pakistan was the uh, this conversation about money going out of CT budgets or maybe being funneled from CT budgets into um, the sort of regulation of religious practice in Pakistan. And obviously um, that um, has pros and cons, and it's uh, something that is quite on the minds of uh, a lot of European policymakers right now as they are basically discussing the same thing. Do we need to have um, uh, a, a religious instruction for uh, uh, imams or other things within the French or the Dutch or other contexts? And I wondered whether there might be important lessons to be drawn from the Pakistani experience about uh, the successes and the failures of, of using securitized money or, or energy to uh, enter into this religious space. Um, would you be able to speak to that? Uh, basically, uh, what I was referring to was a statement by the former military spokesperson who was then uh, the serving person, Major General Asif Wafood. He said that to ensure financing of the madrasas, the religious seminaries, the uh, cash was being diverted from anti-terrorism operations because if you look at statistics, uh, the anti-terrorism of the terrorism uh, in Pakistan activity, they have dwindled over the years. And Pakistan has achieved quite a bit success uh, in, counter in these counter uh, extremism and countering terrorism operations. So it was in context to that because to ca fi ensuring financing to bring them uh, to bring the madrasas which were previously existing without, uh, with, without with outside the ambit of the state it was uh, it is uh, continue it continues to be a difficult task so the point was that because uh, terrorism has reduced in the country the uh, operations that were uh, in full for example a decade ago they were in full swing they have reduced so we have cash now from those operations that can now be diverted to these uh, to ensuring that these madrasas they exist within the state regulations and within the ambit of the state to prevent any such uh, situation from occurring again that we have to launch these uh, operations again sometime in the future, but hopefully not. But that was the point. I hope I've made myself clear. Yeah, thank you for that. I think indeed the, the I guess maybe I'll, just a very quick follow-up question to that. Is there lessons of the effectiveness of more regulation there uh, in the space that you think are uh, applicable as European governments think about uh, how to enter into, you know, uh, yeah, the mostly foreign world of, of what it means to be a good practicing Muslim, but obviously that they are quite concerned about uh, that concept. I'm sorry, can you please repeat that? I didn't... Sure, yeah, I mean, the, the, the general question is obviously uh, that there have been a lot of concerns about what it means to be a, a good Muslim within the Western context and different governments in, in Europe are, leaning more towards helping uh, religious scholars and leaders teach uh, non-violent or non-radical ideas of Islam. Um, but that is obviously as, uh, driven by mostly state security ideas. And there is then in uh, society's attention between uh, do we want the state intervening to tell us how to religiously practice? And also do we want that to be driven by a securitized approach, those two concepts uh, put tension on on uh, the conversation. So I wondered whether, given that I, from it sounds like what you were describing, Pakistan has gone through a similar process, um, if you could just quickly reflect on any of the sort of lessons from that, although recognizing it is maybe a relatively new emergence as well in, in your context. Um, in my research that I've done over the years working on CV initiatives, one thing we've, uh, we've found out that localized solution uh, localized problems need localized solutions you you can't have a one uh, fit all uh, solution for for uh, everything you know it depends on the context it depends on the geography it depends on the so social conditions so one solution that might work in pakistan in this part of the world might not be applicable uh, or not work in the european part of the world that's where the first difference uh, lies I mean, being religious, being a good person, uh, it really depends on person to person and we can't really uh, empirically state, the, state it. Um, uh, this, the first part that you said, uh, 
but but pakistan has done uh, the success has been achieved uh, it is relatively new like you know the serious like i said that the serious work on the regulation and things was done after 2014 and now that we finally managed to uh, geotag the madrasas and bring them into the it will ne- need time it will take time to assess and it will need studies to assess that how far the regulations uh, have been successful and now that we've seen in maybe 5 years or 10 years that that now they've been given equivalence mechanism the madrasa students how are they now able to integrate into the society and what kind of social impact that will have uh, here super uh, okay if yeah. you, alexander if Please. you may allow me uh, can i add <laughs> okay thank you uh, see as i have uh, mentioned before uh, the the problem is very complex in pakistan uh, government is unable to to put a strong grip on the madrasa reforms uh, because of Uh, a, la- uh, a you know a, uh, a sort of uh, sort of a, re- a resilience that is coming from the society from that particular segment who is owning the madrasas right so uh, so for that they are doing it steadily they are now just trying to regulate it once uh, by regulate what i mean is they are trying to uh, regulate the madrasas financially they are keeping an eye on them who is actually teaching inside madrasa and also who is getting the education what kind of education is giving given uh, uh, how many students are living in the boarding uh, what is uh, the interpretation that is giving to those students by the imams so these things are now under strict monitoring uh, they are not trying to change them as yet but they are trying to regulate them uh, but but over the years they will uh, you know tickle down their um, policies uh, towards further strict uh, strengthening the uh, the hold on the madrasas that that is what i am uh, looking uh, towards uh, these problems at the moment so so the problem they are trying to deal with is very steadily and with the slow pace so that uh, uh, th- that the uh, the madrasa section may not uh, retaliate uh, strongly and the problem does not uh, you know come out of control uh, from the secu- uh, from the uh, government uh, th- th- that's that's what i am seeing at the moment yeah i think that's a good a good distinction to be made between sort of trying to understand and regulate the activities and actually change the activities and i, I feel like the, uh, the the european discussion is can we change the activities um because we don't feel like we have uh, the ob- the ability to regulate who comes and goes that's a religious practice question but maybe we want to change the 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 messaging within those contexts so that's that's an important distinction to make um i wanted to i think try to draw the session to a close um by just doing very quickly uh, maybe one minute for everyone with uh, f- a very difficult question which is if you can uh give one sort of overarching most important takeaway from the piece that you that you had um for a policy audience today which is typically who we speak to at ICCT what uh you know one takeaway uh for for folks who stayed on the line and patiently this evening um all bemi just go back through uh in sequence so thomas if you heard that question one minute one takeaway I I do apologize could you repeat the question I lost you for a second Sure yeah no worries it was just 1 minute one key takeaway for our friends in their policy roles uh and that will we'll use to wrap up Yeah if we could give education a chance simply because and if only we could collate that data and we could use it I think uh, it has great advantages um also we need to uh, have studies uh to see its effectiveness thank you thank you um gary uh floor is to you one minute one key takeaway <laughs> well there there really is only one in terms of prison and much of the others and that has to do with very good consistent competent staff training in communication and observation of the people they're working with thanks 
Gary, um, Barbara. I would say just tell policymakers to put themselves in the refugees' shoes. What would they want if they suddenly had to leave their homes? Yeah. Give them that, and we won't have as much of a problem. Super. Uh, where did we go next? We were at IFRA, one minute, one recommendation. Uh, madrasas shouldn't be ostracized for the sake of being madrasas. The problems that do exist, they should be rectified and they should, the original status of them being educational institutions, it should be restored. Uh, implementation is the key. Super, Thank you. thanks. Nina, I'm sorry I didn't get you a live uh, question, although I have several to follow up with you on, um, but uh, I will do that privately. Uh, instead, I'll give you one minute for the most important takeaway uh, from, from your work. Thank you. Before I do it, um, I think I should be respectful in answering the question that was already given to me from Anna, and it was uh, with regard uh, to the PREVENT um, a program in Great Britain, and she was uh, answering um, how I would assess it. And I could do it in two sentences. Okay, I yeah. Would say, <laughs> if you allow Good. me to do so. Yeah, yeah, please. I, I, I did, did see that question. I, I was uh, thinking that that one might need to be a personal connection. After. <laughs> that can be its own chapter, I think. No, no. But go for it. Yeah, please. I, I think we should be so respectful to answer <laughs> it, All right? Sure. So uh, from my point of view, um, the PREVENT uh, program, as well as the CHANNEL program, um, is, if you compare it with other European approaches, um, not very good uh, constructed because it is, um, it is playing with um, surveillance, it is playing uh, with trust, and um, it is also handling with a bad understanding of mental health, uh, which is um, sometimes applied on persons who don't have any mental health problems. We have a lot of cases here um, um, related to this program of uh, recidivism. And we have also no insights. And the BBC calls it, um, let me just quote it, um, it is a system of re-education. And if you are once in the systems, you cannot come out. And from a European kind of understanding of transparency and democracy, this is something that should be avoided. And I guess uh, we could all... Um, <laughs> I hope so, agree on it. Hmm. And so my recommendation would be um, uh, to stop this program and uh, build another one built on uh, democratic um, and ethical issues. Um, so um, coming to your sentence, I would, um, I would recommend uh, that uh, at least in Europe, we should um, unify on a, on a common legal understanding uh, when it comes to the terms and concepts of radicalization as well as uh, on extremism. Because as I mentioned before, if we have various kinds of penalties for crimes or cases related to these concepts or topics, um, it makes it hard to um, speak with one language. And if I understand the idea of a real European Union correctly in a political sense as well, not only from a perspective um, of a religious scientist and his historian, um, we should speak with one language also when it comes to prevention. And if we don't do so, and if you don't build such concepts on one um, common ground, we will failure to prevent. Because if we have so many different understandings of radicalization, of extremism, and uh, in particular of prevention, we won't come to a very good end. And I think we all care here, uh, at least in this uh, chapter area, um, for people and for the future. And we don't give them the future if we can't, as decision makers, or maybe as academics as well, uh, unify on one definition um, of these concepts. Thank you very much. Super. Thank you very much, Nina, for that. Um, I will give Sarah uh, one word, and then I'll hand back to Professor Schmidt to, to wrap things up for us. Thank you. So my uh, key takeaway is actually um, emphasizing this point about the relationship between online behavior and offline action. And so making sure that we really understand fundamentally um, how that manifests at a local level. So funding research to investigate that and then addressing and, and uh, addressing those challenges, addressing the research uh, with practical programs. So a very practical recommendation. Great. Yeah, thank you. That is uh, very helpful. 
Professor Schmidt, this is uh, this is the end of uh, chapter two. I wanted to firstly, before I, I give you the closing remarks, remind all of those who are still with us, and I'm actually quite surprised that everyone has uh, mostly hung on. So thank you. Uh, that there is uh, several more chapters uh, to come, uh, several more presentations uh, like this. Um, we are at ICCT releasing one chapter a week through uh, the spring and early summer until we get to the completion of this excellent volume. Uh, we will expect to do another webinar on the uh, third phase uh, or the phase three of the handbook um, in another month or so, where we will look at uh, prevention of preparatory acts around recruitment, terrorist finance, uh, procurement of weapons, um, and I think that is uh, quite an exciting set of topics to discuss as well. So please, if you haven't already, uh, sign up for the ICCT newsletter. You'll get notifications about the new chapters and uh, the new webinars that come up on the back of this. That is all I wanted to say. And uh, Professor Schmidt, please uh, take us home. Okay, thank you, Alexander. Well, one of the things is there is no glory in prevention because the result is a non-event, something that did not happen. Perhaps that was also one reason why it took so long for such a handbook uh, to materialize. And while there was uh, no real interest in financing such a handbook, I tried with the EU, uh, with the UN, I tried with various parts. So in the end, we all did it ourselves without any money, but with the help of ICCT to bring about this volume. And I'm very thankful to Thomas, to Gary, to Barbara, Asad, Ifa, Nina, Sarah, and also Joseph, Antoinette and Alexander, and uh, all those behind the scenes who helped to bring this about. I look forward to the presentation of part three somewhere in March. And then by June, we should not only have all 35 chapters, we also should have a paperback uh, that uh, at least the authors can put on their bookshelves. Because as uh, omnipresent virtual reality at the online uh, environment is, as long as it's not in the bookshelf, you don't really believe that's real. So thank you again for the authors who participated. Thank you again for the audience, which has in the meantime shrunk to 44. And I hope to see you again in March when we present part three. Back to you, Antoinette. Thanks, everybody. We'll leave it here and say good night, uh, and, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.